Great. I can see the numbers still going up, but let's uh, let's make a start. Welcome, everyone, to this joint event between UK and Exchange Europe, a campaign for social science and the Policy Institute at King's College London on what's next for levelling up. Um, I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute here at King's, and uh, I'm also chair of the Campaign for Social Sciences, which is part of the Academy of Social Sciences which is supported by 33 universities up and down um, the country. Um, and we have a, a really brilliant lineup uh, for this discussion. Um, we're delighted that Andy Haldane will kick us off with his thoughts. Uh, and among his many roles, Andy is, of course, Chief Exec of the RSA and Chair of the Leveling Up Advisory Council. So it'd be great to get his perspective. Um, Andy will do about 10 minute outline um, and then we'll get thoughts from a really great panel on this uh, and we've asked them to focus on a couple of key questions as we see it which is what they think should be next for leveling up and what they think will be next uh, for leveling up we'll see what the contrast comes out uh, between uh, those two visions uh, for the future uh, we'll hear first from Gemma Tetlow who's chief economist at the Institute uh, for Government then Anand Menon who's director of UK in a changing Europe uh, and then Rebecca Riley is Associate Professor of Enterprise Engagement and Impact at the University of Birmingham. And uh, finally, Suzanne Hall, who's Director of Engagement at the Policy Institute at King's, who will touch on some joint work UK and Exchanging Europe and uh, the Policy Institute have been doing uh, among the public on this, these questions. Then I think we'll, we'll get some reflections back from Andy on people's contributions and hopefully a bit of discussion, a bit more conversational discussion. But we will keep time for questions from you at the end. So do use the Q&A function that we've all got used to on these uh, types of calls. Uh, do, do get them in early. It's always advantageous to be in early um, for, to get selected because we're probably going to have limited time at the end. And I, I really do love these tight one hour sessions uh, over lunch because one reason being it. Uh, we need to crack on and you don't get much flannel uh, from me, uh, but we do get through a lot of things. So uh, over to Andy, uh, please. Well, thank you, Bobby, for that. And um, afternoon, everyone. Um, fantastic to be here uh, on this distinguished panel. I thought I might kick off just by saying a little bit, um, looking backwards, actually, on what has been done over the year uh, since the Lovely and White Paper was published, and then maybe just a couple of reflections looking ahead, building from that uh, as a bridge uh, to the contribution of panelists. So one year on, uh, where are we? Uh, we'll look to our fourth Secretary of State for leveling up now over that period, although the fourth is the same as the first. So in that sense, there has been a degree of uh, continuity uh, and stability, and indeed um, with Michael Gove at the helm, I think uh, a good degree of dynamism around this debate uh, looking ahead. I mean, I think if you're looking for any evidence in the key economic or social or health metrics for progress over that year, you'd struggle to find uh, any. Um, that by itself, I think, is not the world's most surprising thing. Leveling up like many realms of public policy uh, is slow to turn, super tanker-like uh, to turn, and many of the key contours of regional disparity, like everyone accepts having taken 50 plus years to become entrenched will take quite some little while to uh, be reversed, and that's why the missions that were set uh, in that white paper stretched out to 2030. Uh, and despite um, much, if any, evidence of outcomes having much altered when it comes to levelling up or missions having been fulfilled. That doesn't mean nothing has happened. I think there have been uh, bits of action over the past uh, 12 months. I'll mention one or two of them. And while it is fair to say uh, that action still will fall well short, of what's needed to come close to hitting the missions. Nonetheless, uh, some useful directional steps have been taken. So let me touch upon on those, some of those. Um, I think the place where progress has been greatest 
has been the area of uh, devolution and decentralization uh, of powers. <clears throat> We've had the announcements, a range of new Devo deals, or indeed uh, embryonic mayoralties, including in North Yorkshire, uh, a new area in uh, the Northeast, uh, in Cornwall, in Norfolk, in Suffolk, etc. And we also have, that's the widening part of Devo, if you like. Uh, and coming down the pipe, I think pretty quickly, perhaps even at budget time, will be a couple of uh, deepening deals, trailblazer deals, uh, in Greater Manchester and in uh, the uh, West Midlands. Uh, and that is all uh, pretty much, I think, uh, on schedule relative to white paper uh, path. I think pretty good progress in a relatively short period uh, over time. And more broadly, of course, this Devo debate uh, is now very much live. Uh, Gordon Brown's report at the end of last year provided a degree of giddy up to this uh, debate and both sides of the aisle now uh, are now talking about an ambitious plan uh, for further deeper, uh, further and wider, uh, as well as deeper, deeper, which I think is a thoroughly good thing. Another place where progress has been made, in some ways is the kind of counterpart uh, to that Devo movement has been in the area of accountability uh, with extra responsibilities need to come extra accountabilities. Indeed, even for the existing Devo deals, many would argue, including me, that they suffer something of an accountability uh, gap. That will only widen uh, as Devo is widened and deepened and therefore playing catch up is important. Uh, one element of that uh, is the new proposed uh, Office of Local Government, uh, or OFLOG, I think is its abbreviation, hard to think of a more um, uh, unprepossessing abbreviation than that. Uh, nonetheless, its task uh, is an important one, and that's not just about keeping local government's feet uh, to the flame, ensuring value for money. But for me, every bit, and perhaps even more important, uh, it's about establishing uh, what is working well, what is working less well, and using that as a catalyst for improvement of the way in which local government uh, is operating, learning by doing at the local level, if you like. And if Offlog is to work well, uh, it will see it do at least as much of that as it is calling people uh, to account failed uh, projects. We have to provide underpinnings for all of this, uh, a levelling up uh, bill wending its way uh, through Parliament. Hopefully that will uh, be done and dusted before the year is out. Among the important things that will enshrine uh, will be the missions, at least in general terms, in statute, and as importantly, uh, reporting. Uh, against progress uh, on those missions. That bill for me uh, falls well short or the my wish list, but nonetheless uh, does contain some useful strengthening measures to hopefully ensure that Lovely has a degree of uh, longevity underpinned by primary legislation. That's been a feature sadly absent ever much of the preceding the years. And finally, when it comes uh, to the thorny but important issues of monies, uh, we have seen some monies distributed to support uh, levelling uh, up. The lightning rod for that uh, discussion tends to be the thing that calls itself the levelling up fund, the LUF. I said that's rather unfortunate, really, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, levelling up isn't just achieved the levelling up fund. There's all pockets, lots of them, of monies, too many of them, you might say, uh, supporting broadly defined uh, levelling. Uh, so the name is a bit misleading. And the second unfortunate thing, well exemplified by the second round of distributions from the levelling up fund, is that that is run uh, on a competitive basis between different parts 
uh, which means there are as many or more losers from that process as uh, there are winners. Uh, and that is a recipe uh, for a PR uh, disaster, currently where TUFA on that, having had two rounds of learning up funding uh, so far. I hope that will be looked at in the course of time to see whether competitive bidding is the right way uh, to distribute money. Uh, my strong and long held view is that it uh, is not. But of course, that's not the only game in town, despite being a lightning rod issue. Uh, we have the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, now actually doing a broader range of things than is currently being done by the EU central funds that they replace. Uh, we have uh, the Towns Fund, we have local government financing. And just last week, we had this new uh, Community Wealth Fund or some such um, being uh, developed uh, off the back of the second sort of dormant uh, assets to support community level uh, regeneration can be very much welcome, mooted uh, in the levelling up uh, white paper as a way of giving effect, not just to Devo, but to double Devo to the uh, hyper local level. A couple of reflections just looking ahead from now, Bobby, and then I'll stop. Uh, the first, uh, and I'd say grounds for optimism, uh, is that for those who had concerns about the longevity uh, of leveling up, I'd say some at least of those concerns have been allayed. Why do I say that? Uh, well, one important reason I say that is because we now have a degree of cross-party consistency uh, on the topic. We have uh, both of the main parties uh, doing what I always hoped might happen off the back of the white paper actually, which is competing for virtue uh, on this topic. And to an extent, playing a game of leapfrog uh, with it, that I hope will give us uh, the cross-party, uh, cross-electoral continuity, which will be essential uh, for turning the tide uh, or altering the direction of that super tanker I mentioned uh, earlier on. Secondly, there is of course much, much further to go when it comes to all matters, uh, Devo and decentralization, even with the measures I've mentioned in place, that was still leave the UK as an extreme outlier when it comes to its degree of current uh, centralization. The white paper set as a mission uh, that every part of the UK that wanted powers equal, uh, at least equal to London, could have them. Sort of distance from that. And of course, it's still, it also begs the question about whether London's powers uh, are as deep and rich uh, as might be wished. Uh, we are now, what, 20 years uh, into London Devo. We should also ask ourselves the question about where next uh, for London. That will necessarily uh, cause us or draw us in to the conversation kicked off by the Brown Report, which is about uh, Devo of tax raising powers alongside Devo of spending powers, you really cannot have any ever, any ever, over any lengthy period of time uh, a debate of one without the other. That is a one way of making Devo incentive compatible. Finally, on, uh, on monies, I mean, looking ahead, there's so much that could and should be done uh, in harmonizing the hundred and odd current funding pots uh, in homogenizing their criteria and indeed lengthening their duration uh, in a way that gives a common long-term settlement to local areas for them to see fit in line with local need to do with as they wish. And finally, a uh, final point from me, uh, Bobby, is not about uh, government monies, but it is about uh, private sector monies. Uh, the government's pockets uh, are not especially deep, but the private sectors really are when it comes to patient capital. And much more must be done uh, to mobilise uh, that private, uh, patient capital from pension funds and the like, including local government uh, pension funds. Some modest baby steps in that direction so far. So much more uh, should be done. When I look around the world of, of, of uh, examples, of successful levelling up, particularly of cities, uh, you find the lead is provided um, as much by the private sector as by the public sector 
and the monies are provided to a much bigger degree from the private sector than from the public sector. And that's a big shift from where we've been in the UK, but substantively and culturally, it's a change we need to make if we are to make progress uh, on uh, levelling up. On that, Bobby, I think I will uh, stop and pass the floor back to you. No, excellent. Thank you. And I think the sort of short answer to what next for levelling up is a lot. <laughs> got a long way to go just at the start and there's a lot of strands to this so uh, I'm just going to hand over to Jem in a second just to say uh, great questions coming in um, do keep them coming as we get through this discussion but over to you please Gemma. Thank you very much um, so you posted two questions to all of us what do we think should happen on levelling up and what we think will happen on levelling up um, I mean, a lot of what Andy set out there um, very much chimes with sort of what I've seen um, over recent months since last year's white paper from the government. Um, so my sort of three things that I think should happen on levelling up. Um, first, I would hope that there would be further commitment to and strengthening the sort of systems reforms that were laid out in that white paper last year. Um, for me, that was one of the strongest aspects of the white paper was identifying the problems that there are with the lack of join up across Whitehall departments in tackling some of these issues that really matter for levelling up. The role of having clear missions and reporting against those as a way of kind of focusing effort and holding people's feet to the fire. Um, I thought it was really important. Um, there are signs that some of that is happening, um, but perhaps not as much um, as we might hope. And I think there's been less progress there than on the devolution aspect that Andy was talking about. Um, so the second area I'd like to see more progress is on that devolution agenda. Um, there was a lot of ambition in the white paper, as Andy said, we have seen further progress with new devolution deals signed. Um, but there is quite a lot further to go in thinking about what are the most appropriate powers to push down to different subnational governments and how do we deal with parts of the country that at the moment don't have a sort of uh, more macro tier of subnational government that can take on those sorts of powers. Um, and I think funding is a real important part of addressing devolution. As Andy alluded to at the moment, we've got a, a lot of small pots of money that get filtered down to local governments and to the combined authorities and that money can't then be reallocated within an area to different priorities to sort of maximize the benefit of that money at local areas i think addressing the way that funding is provided for leveling up and for other local priorities is a real really important issue um and thirdly uh like to see more ambition in some of the areas um of uh, leveling up the the missions lots of positives in the missions but in some areas um perhaps not enough ambition or perhaps not incorporating some aspects of policy that might be really important for delivering on leveling up so the areas i'd highlight there would be around skills there was a noticeable absence of thinking about early years uh education and sort of post-18 non-university qualifications were sort of a bit notable by their absence in in the skills missions um, and then on sort of infrastructure and research and development, um, perhaps a, there's arguably a case for sort of focusing efforts there in areas of higher economic potential, so particularly if government funds are limited, then thinking about where can you get most bang for your buck in some of those um, investments, I think there's more need for the government to focus on that and thinking about how it can deliver most from the money that is spent. Um, so what do I expect will happen? I, mean, I sort of touched on this a little bit already. Um, on devolution, um, I think I'm very positive. There does seem to have been a lot of development on the, that front, as Andy said. Um, and there does seem to be a lot of positive noises coming about out about what we might hear about the trailblazer deals in or around the budget. So that seems to be an area where we've made a lot of progress. Um, so like caveat on that is I think we may see progress in sort of addressing the lots of different funding pots problem for those trailblazer deal areas. But for most of the rest of the country, I think we'll continue to have this issue of a, a lot of separate competitive pots that Andy talked about, which do have uh, problems associated with them. 
On the other systems reforms, um, less progress seems to have been made there. Um, perhaps more difficult for Michael Gove to drive changes across other parts of Whitehall where he doesn't have direct control. Um, and that may be why we're seeing more in terms of devolution progress than we have on those sort of central government reforms. Um, and finally, I think we're going to continue to have very constrained public budgets. So um, whatever we're able to achieve on levelling up is probably going to be more refocusing the money that's already spent to get more out of it, rather than expecting that we're going to have a lot of new money to deal with any of these problems. Great stuff, Gemma. Thank you very much. And I was thinking, Andy, that we'll go through all the contributions and it'd be great if you'll just get some reflections back on all or any of them that stand out to you just before we get into discussion and questions. So next uh, up is Anand, please. Anand. Thanks, Bobby. I, I can be very quick, actually, in the sense that I basically agree with Gemma, but I feel a little bit more grumpy than she sounded. So I'll just be grumpier, but be very quick about it. I mean, Andy's quite right. There's, there's an awful lot of dynamism about the debate about levelling up. But whilst it's probably unfair to say it's all talk and no trousers, it's certainly an awful lot of talk and a rather disappointing pair of trousers that have emerged so far. I mean, I'm old enough to remember, you know, the start of this political consensus in July 2016 when Theresa May gave that speech about the just about managing. So what is it now? Seven years of very worthy talk about levelling up the country from which it strikes me that precious little of practical or impact that has had an impact on these areas has actually emerged. And I think like Gemma, I don't want to sort of misquote Gemma, I mean, the should and the will, what, what should happen? The government should act on what was a rather good critique of 30 years of policymaking in the white paper. What will happen, I fear, is yet again, the government will do which I, what I always do, which is identify its mistakes and keep on making exactly the same ones ad infinitum. And I think there's a kind of doom loop element about this that I find quite depressing. So if you think the three things, siloization, centralization, short termism, uh, they persist. I mean, we've nibbled at the edges. Uh, when it comes to siloization, I sometimes think no one's told the Treasury about levelling up. I mean, you see the thing about HS2 today. I mean, the sense that we're overcoming those ministerial divisions strikes me as fanciful. When we talk about centralization, we're still, I mean, as Andy said this, just eye-wateringly fiscally centralized in this country and things like this begging bowl approach to getting funds simply reinforces a mindset that those who impress Westminster and Whitehall will do best in this game and thirdly when it comes to short short termism what I would say is the sort of the, the massive politicization of this debate doesn't help I mean we're all familiar with those studies that reveal a curious overlap between Tory constituencies and government munificence when it comes to levelling up. You know, this isn't the first government that's done that. You can make the same case about some education spending under Labour. I mean, governments tend to fund places where they want to get votes. That, But it, it, it doesn't speak to the what was, I thought, a very, very good white paper that accurately sort of took apart some of the fundamental problems, both in terms of the reality of regional inequality and some of the problems that are still in the way. And actually, these thoughts lead me to a depressing question which is whether our political system is structurally capable of dealing with the challenge of leveling up because it strikes me that short-termism centralization and siloization are inherent features of our political system uh, and they have been for a long time uh, which leads me to an even more depressing question is which is if we keep talking about it and fail to do anything meaningful what will be the political impact of this as Andy quite rightly said one of the implications of the 2016 referendum were a shift in our, was a shift in our political debate where this, in, this sort of emphasis on inequality became far, far more central. And I fear that failing to do, failing to take action that resonates with people who were expecting far, far more is simply going to have the impact of increasing already very high levels of disaffection with our politics. So I thought I'll leave you with that cheery thought. Always a joy, Anand. Um, <laughs> but that was brilliantly done. Really, really, uh, really clear outline. And that centralization, centralization, short term is such a great challenge to put to us, um, uh, to us all. And it does make me reflect on my background was in evaluating area based initiatives um, when I started out, and the raise of raising of expectations and then not meeting them is can just be dire for 
people's sense of connection to an endeavor or an organization or institution. So yeah, absolutely, really important to flag. Thank you, Anand. And uh, Rebecca, you're up next. Thanks, Bobby. Um, I suppose from, from my point of view, um, it's quite interesting what Alan said about 2016, but actually levelling up is not a new problem. And we've been trying to tackle this for decades. Um, and I think um, we've got successive governments have tried and failed to a lesser degree to solve it. Uh, and although the label, the policy label has changed, levelling up should actually be about tackling those long term persistent structural issues, uh, which became embedded in places left behind after the de demise of heavy industry. Um, there's been a wide range of pro programs and policies to tackle this. And uh, uh, from the 1920s, industrial transference scheme, the urban program in the 1960s, city deals, government office RDAs in the 90s, which is sort of where I started my career, um, and now through to the process that we have of, as Andy mentioned, competitive funding that seems to be linked with levelling up. Uh, there is, however, a disjoint between what people see on the ground and want fixing versus the things that are needed to change places in the long term, those big structural issues. Uh, and this is a really difficult balancing act for government. And actually it's seen in the Policy Institute's report on what people think, actually, that, that, that divergence. What we've learned from all this activity in the past before is that to improve places, we need consistent, coherent funding, which any of the speakers have mentioned. Um, but we're actually in this, in this weird process of uh, what's referred to as the hanging basket approach of competitive funding in investment. Uh, Andy actually mentioned losers uh, and, you know, as many losers as winners. Well, it's far worse than that. If you took the West Midlands example, there were over 100 bids in round one of levelling up and only 11 were funded. That's a, that's a huge waste of uh, resources and capacity in that process. Um, so levelling up should be about giving people three C's, capacity, confidence and courage to drive change. Um, providing public investment in place helps businesses, as Andy pointed out, and people have confidence to invest in themselves and their place. Uh, so, so the where next question, uh, I think we should put investment where it's needed. And actually the levelling up analysis is one of the best pieces of analysis we've seen from some time, and we should take notice of it and design interventions that tackle those issues. We really need to end this lurching from competitive program to program and streamline, as Gemma mentioned, the, the wealth of different funding uh, areas that there are and bring them into uh, sort of tackling those structural areas, such as skills, innovation, enterprise and infrastructure, but do that through local structures and accountability. Um, uh, this will provide confidence to markets Businesses and local people need that long term investment in place, even if it's small to start to, to generate uh, and offset some of the risk. And I think in terms of helping places to have the confidence, then we have to invest in the skills and expertise to drive change locally and develop their evidence and evaluation skills and encourage learning from others. The competitive process has meant that places aren't really learning from each other. What do I think will be next? Um, I think the first thing to know is. Um, the mission targets in the Lovely Up paper don't actually match departmental targets. And until there's alignment between those two things, we'll still end up with this piecemeal process. I worry that the ethos of Lovely Up, which I think you know, you think is, is essentially correct, could be lost in the political debate between now and the election and that instability. And there is a danger that new government, which, whichever colour it is, wants something different to distance itself from the previous given, government. And we end up in a process of renaming the policy. The focus is lost, but the issues remain the same. Great. That's excellent again, Rebecca. We're so professional this because everyone's got their three uh, little words or phrases that, that people can remember. So that was another great capacity, confidence, courage. Um, that's... Uh, a uh, great thing to bear in mind too. So we're up to uh, final speaker, which is um, Suzanne. 
Thanks, Bobby. Um, I spied a question from Joseph Owen in the chat about the role of qual in understanding what what people want from leveling up, and 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 it's essential. And over the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk through some findings from some from some qualitative work that we did with Natsen last year. We ran a series of discussion groups in Barnsley, in Blythe, in Blackpool, in Barking, and in Nottingham. In retrospect, we should have chosen somewhere else that begins with B. Um, and in these groups, we talked about what what people thought leveling up was, what their hopes were for it, and also what they were concerned about. So my discussion here is, is from the participant perspective, what the public want, what they think is going to happen, and what they think should happen. Now, these groups are not representative, they're not meant to be, but they do help to shine a light on what matters to people, and also the language that they use to talking about these issues. In the interests of keeping it positive, I'm going to focus primarily on what they thought should happen, so what they wanted from levelling up. But before I get onto that, I think it's worth stating that people spontaneously identified so many positives with, with where they lived and features that they thought made it unique. So without exception, they were proud of where they were from and they enjoyed talking about it. And there were a whole range of factors which underpin this. Things like green spaces and areas of natural beauty, and that mattered as much when you talked to but someone in Barking about their local park as it did when you talked to someone in Blythe about the beach huts and the and the seafront. They talked about local heritage, so whether that's their industrial past in Barnsley or local landmarks like the Olympic Park for Barking's residents. They talked about how they were represented in popular culture because this means that someone else in another part of the country knows something about them and what it means to be from that area. Sporting success, so people in Blythe talked about the Spartans and their amazing FA Cup runs. People in Nottingham talked about forest promotion. They didn't really talk about what happened after that point, but we can come back to that. And accents and dialect and character, all these things that make an area special and unique. But because they were able to identify things that they were proud of, it didn't blind them to the fact that there's an awful lot of things that need improving as well. And this is where they hoped that levelling up could make a difference. And they honed in on four key areas that I'm going to run through. The first is addressing the housing problem. And participants said that without this, it's, it's for nothing. They said that there's a limited supply of affordable and suitable housing that was most prevalent, of course, you'd imagine among participants embarking but the attendant issue is it forces people out of the area that they live and they know that this means that this weakens community ties they also wanted more good good job opportunities and that ties in with I think with what Gemma was saying about skills and R&D and investment there they wanted something with stability with opportunities for progression the situation as it is made people in former industrial areas look back on what they had fondly and they didn't want to see the shipyards reopen or the mines reopen but they did want what that industry represented a good job as long as you want it and something that gave their place a sense of purpose so one part participant in Barnsley said, you know, when a big employer leaves an area, it leaves desolation behind. We're coming back from it, but areas that have varied employment don't suffer as much. Steelworks, mining, it all went and it leaves a big hole. Participants also talked about failing public services, health, education, transport. I mean, on transport, that could have been a whole discussion in and of itself. And it's the lack of it which promotes social isolation, but also hinders economic development. Participants in Blythe spoke about being literally at the end of the line. They felt that's how they felt where they were. And it also shone a light on regional inequalities too. So people in Blythe sort of looked to the Metro in Newcastle, and people in Barnsley spoke about the public transport system in Leeds. And as someone said, there's no transport links. It's difficult to get to other places. You have generation after generation stuck in the same cycle of poverty, boredom, no jobs. Finally, participants spoke about high streets and how, as a rule, they're just not places that they want to go. They spoke about shuttered up shops. The shops that are open aren't ones that they particularly want to go to. Um, and because of that, other people don't want to come into the area as well. One participant in Blythe said, you know, I bypass the town centre altogether. There's just nothing really there. You've got your betting shops, your charity shops, that kind of thing. Just nothing that you want to go to. And all of this taken together left participants proud of their area, but, but sympathetic as to why people might actually want to move away. And they really resented this because they know that community ties are going to weaken and it's going to affect prime place. So just to close, I think it's worth saying that 
participants didn't have a great deal of optimism that these changes would be realized through leveling up. And there are three big issues at play here. The first is that they didn't think that they'd be consulted about what their areas really needed. So I think the devolution questions that, that Andy was talking about at the beginning are interesting here because they wanted to be consulted and they wanted to be meaningfully consulted through dialogues, through consultations, through deliberations. They want to make sure that their lived experience is reflected in any policies that are implemented. And Offlog is going to have its work cut out when you listen to participants because they just don't trust the politicians, um, you know, in London, but also local councillors to be able to make the right calls on this. There's a real sense that politicians are out of touch, not invested in taking the time to work out what matters to local residents. This dates the research somewhat because one participant said about a re recent trip by then Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson, he didn't know if he was in Tyneside or Teesside and that says it all really. And, and going back to what everyone has said about competitive bidding, they thought that the current bidding process was skewed against the areas that really need help, that it has unfairness baked into the system because the local authorities that need the money don't have the funds, they don't have the time to draft winning bids or employ the services of consultants to help them to do so. And I think this pessimism is an issue and this goes to, to Anand's point, because the residents we spoke to don't only want change for their area, they need it. And what they're asking for is, is not outrageous. They want to be able to look down the road and feel that they've got the same opportunities and the same facilities as people living in the next town. But as it stands, they'd remain unconvinced that levelling up is the way to do it. And I think failing to live it is only going to serve to heighten the mis this mistrust and sense of disconnection that exists. Right, that was excellent, Suzanne. Thank you. Very powerful to hear that directly and echoing many of the other uh, challenges and the difficulties of this, of um, balancing uh, what people really see as their pressing immediate needs and that long term structural uh, plan that you need as well. Um, very good. So, Andy, um, uh, reflections and thoughts on all of that, <laughs> the answer to all of those uh, points, but uh, just your reflections, Andy. Oh, well, thanks, Bobby. And what a fantastic um, set of uh, interventions. I mean, not just the richness of the content, but also I'll have to just line up for me to finish off that box of Maltesers I've been <laughs> consuming um, this morning. Um, we'll just maybe touch upon one or two of the points um, raised by each of the uh, panellists. I mean, Gemma's quite right. Uh, the remaining question marks around skills, the remaining question marks around r and D. I I feel a little bit more uh, confident on the second of those than on the first. So we, we have a Prime Minister and a government uh, that has made quite something uh, of, of wishing to up the ante on all matters science superpower. It remains to be seen exactly what form Investment Zones 2.0 uh, take. I think they'd like to have a strong uh, R&D and uh, university focus on skills. I feel more pessimistic in some ways because I think that is, of all the uh, Achilles heels, plural, that UK, UK PLC faces, that is probably the most uh, acute. And we're still, I think, um, some distance away from having a package of skills-based policies that is any way, shape or form commensurate with the scale of the skills deficits that the UK has accumulated over uh, many decades uh, now. To an end, uh, and I very much like his silos, centralization and short termism uh, as uh, the reason why we find ourselves where we find ourselves uh, and the reason why there's grounds for pessimism uh, in breaking free of each of those uh, binding constraints. If only as a, a mini antidote um, to that pessimistic I do think that salvation to some degree uh, does lie in the second. So if we can uh, move to a, a much less centralized governance model in the UK, I think that would serve a uh, triple duty. Uh, it is the right thing to do anyway, uh, but it would also help with the silo problem. Because when it comes to connecting the dots across the arms of policy, that is frankly impossible at the Whitehall level, but does become feasible uh, at the local level, indeed. Some of the best examples of 
Evo being successful, not just in this country, but internationally, have come from the capacity to join the different parts of policy in a, in a local strategy. Uh, and uh, that becomes possible locally in a way that's uh, always going to be impossible nationally. It also, I think, helps Evo and decentralization when it comes to the short termism uh, challenge. I say that because. I think we're in a position now um, where regional politics are significantly more stable uh, than our national uh, politics. The average tenure of a mayor is many, many multiples the average tenure of a minister. I think that does give um, some hope that if we go down the local path, we will get a greater degree of constancy than has been the case uh, in the past. So Rebecca's um, very good points, I think she highlighted rightly um, these combined problems of a multiplicity of funding pots, which are basically impossible for anyone to navigate, whether in Whitehall or outside of Whitehall, allied with what has been a denuding of capacity at the local level over the last 20 or 30 years. And that, that compounds the problem. So you have no, almost no people who are able to process all these funding applications. And, and salvation here comes from acting on both parts, both simplifying and harmonizing and lengthening uh, the funding uh, arithmetic and building capacity uh, at the local level, which is uh, sorely needed. Approach on both arms, I think, to achieve success. And finally, on Suzanne and the really interesting qualitative, qualitative evidence there on what matters. And it's striking, particularly in the poorer parts, poorer parts of the UK, how high up that list comes the issues that Suzanne mentioned most which is issues uh, of security and safety, uh, issues of social infrastructure, history, culture, and heritage. I think that is absolutely right. Uh, and as much as I love uh, cars and trains and broadband, in other words, physical and digital infrastructure, most people love every bit as much social infrastructure, the football clubs, the decent park streets, uh, the museums uh, and the like. And yet, and yet, the social dimension of infrastructure is very much the correlation relative to the other two, the digital and the physical. I'd like to see that change uh, looking ahead because I, I do think that, that that social infrastructure is as existential to leveling up and effective placemaking uh, as any other aspect Stop there, Stuff, Andy. So I did want to give the panel any chance to redirect or come back to Andy on any of those themes before we go to questions. Is there anything anyone wants to pick up, clarify, or expand on with Andy's responses? No? Oh, and then, yep, please. Yeah, I mean, this. Look, I'm going to be grumpy with anyone who eats Maltesers when I've missed lunch. So I'm sorry about this, Andy. <laughs> but. Uh, I mean, on that last point about social, I sort of buy the point about social capital, but I just sort of think, you know, from, 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 from the town I grew up, you talk to your average person there, if there was a trade-off between investment and having the Hepworth, they'd go for investment. I mean, let's not pretend that there aren't absolutely dire socioeconomic circumstances in some of these people that people want addressing. And I think sticking a seminar like this saying, oh yes, cultural capital is really important. Of course it is, but it's not as important as proper jobs and proper transport to get you to and from those. Sorry, I just wanted to get that off my chest. <laughs> I think that's good. This is a sharing environment. And it's good. Um, any is it SA space? <laughs> it's, it's, I would use that phrase. Uh, it is, uh, any thoughts, Andy, or I can, because it's actually a segue into some of the questions, but yeah. any, anything to... Well, all, all I'd say is, um, you know, I wasn't viewing these things as either or. Um, uh, I think you need both. I mean, ultimately, if, if places are to thrive, you can create all the jobs you want and all the houses you want uh, and all the railway stations and trains 
uh, that you want. But there's nothing to do uh, after six o'clock in the evening. People aren't going to want to live there uh, and it will not succeed. So I think it's and rather than uh, or. I think it's fantastic. And um, for example, that Bradford will be the, uh, the UK city of culture in 2025. I think that will be a huge motor uh, for jobs uh, and for skills as well as for um, uh, as well as for culture. But the, the, the broader point is we I think we need um, elements of, uh, of um, uh, uh, to succeed long term. Great, thanks Andy. Um, <clears throat> and thank you everyone for some, some really brilliant questions. After me encouraging lots of questions, it's going to mean I'm <laughs> going to get through a tiny fraction of them in the period. So don't, I'm sorry that I won't be able to do more, but I did want to pick up. I'm trying to get a sense of the different themes, and I think it'd be wrong given the repeated mention of HS2 not to touch on that with from people in the question. So at a time where HS2 is being delayed, it descoped, and the very few other mass transit system upgrades under development in cities and towns across the UK, is it actu actually possible to level up in the future? We have no new mass transport schemes coming on board, despite the plethora of evidence showing transport as a key limitation to UK cities' economic performance and then there were several other questions from others along that kind of theme i'm going to start with andy i think but then definitely ask for any interventions and um uh, uh, additional thoughts from the panel well um, very briefly uh i wouldn't profess particular expertise any expertise on on hs2 uh per se. all i would say is um a bit like the lovely up front this too has become a lightning rod sort of diagnostic on whether we're doing this at all or at all well. And sometimes I think is a bit unfortunate, um, not because doing it well isn't important, is important, but when it comes to what really matters to local people, usually that's local transport uh, rather than intercity uh, transport. You know, I think it is a huge regret to an Anne's point uh, earlier on, um, that the, the Bradford, it remains disconnected from the mains. And that is a real cost of HSB, uh, HST having been um, cut back. But uh, an even bigger tragedy, I would say, is that it takes forever to get from Leeds to Bradford, which is five minutes away, ought to be five minutes away, and currently takes forever. So in all this debate about transport, the local often matters every bit as much, if not more. Great stuff. Anyone else? Gemma, has any thoughts from your view? Um, I mean, I sort of agree with Andy in terms of thinking, I'm not sure HS2 is the thing that was going to level up a lot of areas that was really about intercity connections. And Andy said a lot of levelling up is much more about the connections into and around other city regions elsewhere in the UK. I, mean, I would be, I just sort of agree with the concern in the question that transport for many areas is a big, one of the big hurdles to um, levelling up and improving the economic circumstance of some areas is improving transport connections. That doesn't necessarily have to be fixed rails. It could be improving bus network connections as well. But I think it's worth, it, not all areas face a transport problem and it's not always the only or the main barrier. I think Rebecca may want to say more, but I think the West Midlands is one of those areas where actually there are quite a lot of areas that are struggling, but actually transport connections is not the problem there. So it's not the only thing that we need to be pushing on. Great stuff. <clears throat> yeah, just to be fair to the questioner, I think it was mass transport generally with HS2 as an example rather than that. But Rebecca, any reflections from your point of view on how this fits in? Um, I suppose just picking up on some of the things Suzanne mentioned in her report um, about people's perceptions and, and what they want from place. I think um, at, at the time of HS2 first coming to sort of into the fore, I, I was actually at, uh, in, I was based in the Northwest Regional Development Agency. And I think there was a, there's a problems with perceptions of HS2 right from the start in the selling something which was high speed, getting northerners to London, wasn't necessarily a good sell to those local people because it doesn't affect their life for the vast majority. However, the real benefits of um, HS2, which are, you know, which, which have been explored an awful lot, but weren't weren't used as the mechanism to pub publish it, uh, sort of publicise or get investment in it, um, were the things like actually high speed two is about getting a lot of trains off local lines so that you can improve local connectivity. It was about getting um, higher gauge trains so that you could put 
um, the um, take things off lorries and put them on trains. So you were reducing the environmental footprint, but those weren't the things that were sold to the local people. So then it becomes a divisive mechanism. Um, I still think those things are valid. I think, as Gemma said, though, for some areas, it's not it's not about the transport. It's about whether whether there are jobs locally, like Anne answered. Um, and can people access those jobs and where there is jobs growth? So West Midlands, for instance, has had an awful lot of jobs growth in the professional services sector. But people are coming in to take those jobs. So what do you do about your local uh, population to train them up into those those gaps and those vacancies that are emerging? Um, but some of this is just about how these things are presented um, to, to the public and how they engage with it. Great stuff. Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else on this? Two just seconds. just on the on the public's perceptions, I think just to, to highlight and reiterate really what Andy was saying about this is that it is regional transport that really matters to participants. I mean, some of them did mention HS2 and that they didn't think that that's where money should be going uh, and what they really wanted was investment in in their local transport and they they talked about three main reasons for this really one is to strengthen social connections one is for sustainability issues so that people could get out of their cars and onto public transport instead one is for the economy as well and they thought that that would have so many spillover effects it would help re reinvigorate high streets bring more people into the area and also it would help tackle regional inequality because that's the thing that they were really bothered about as well. They didn't like looking to the next town or the next city and seeing that they had a better public transport system than they did. It really made them feel that they were left out and, and heightened the divisions. Thank you. So um, another of the key themes across the questions is around devolution. Um, I'm going to cut to cut to straight to a really great question from Jack Brown, I think, on... Uh, partly because he says great discussion at the start of his question. That's always, always nice. Um, but his question is, does the panel agree that more devolution without fiscal devolution stroke greater tax raising powers could actually be a step backwards for levelling up? Um, to be very simplistic, is there a world where we establish more mayoralties but don't give them adequate powers to really change things locally, real control over money, and doing so simply confuse local democratic accountability and potentially create future scapegoats for central government to blame local policy failures which is really interesting uh question uh i think it's uh uh ties in lots of different elements of this but just reflections on that connection between devolution and tax raising and uh accountability alongside um the powers to fulfill it would be really interesting to get reflection i'm going to start again with you andy because it's um and then give the panel a bit of time to have a think about that as well was that me bobby sorry that uh, you yeah sorry hey, sorry yep. i'm happy to um kick off and i think a very relevant um very relevant question i mean um i mean one thing to say and, and this point was very clearly i think in gordon brown's report on the topic is um and to be careful in jumping too quickly to tax Evo if the playing field is as unlevel as it currently is in the UK. And that's because the, the, the tax base in the poorer regions is sufficiently small that fully relying on that too quickly uh, would not uh, deliver the monies you would need for the extra investment in those places to get them uh, up. So you don't want to uh, destabilize poorer places by going down this path too hastily. The international experience really speaks in that direction. Nonetheless, is this the path down which we need to be headed uh, as we devolve more spending powers? Uh, absolutely uh, yes. Otherwise, you'll get the sort of dynamic we've already seen actually uh, hitherto, which is that you know, no amount of money is ever enough uh, at the local. Uh, level and the way to reconcile that is to say to uh, Andy, not this Andy, another Andy, um, if you want the um, extra uh, hospital uh, or um, uh, whatever it might be, uh, then by all means go ahead, but raise power, raise taxes locally to to, to pay for it. And I think that is the ultimate accountability. Uh, device 
it's not a substitute uh, for an offlog or other transparency devices, but it is the ultimate uh, democratic way of ensuring monies are uh, well spent, and that would definitely be the right one. Sequence path towards that is what we need. Great, thanks, Andy. Any other thoughts from anyone? Just looking around the panel. You're unmuting, Gemma, I think. Um, yeah, I have to add a few thoughts into that mix. Um, I mean, firstly, I think there is quite a long way we could go with improving how the current funding allocations work to get rid of the sort of lots of different funding competitive pots, which at the moment act against some of the benefits that ought to be there from devolving spending powers down to a local level. But one of the potential benefits there is at a local level being able to see the synergies between policy areas and to focus money where you can have most impact. And at the moment, a lot of the potential for that is inhibited by the fact that local areas are getting lots of different funding streams from central government that they can't then reallocate money between those um, to do things more effectively at their areas. So I think there is quite a long way we could go before we even get to the question of devolving tax powers. Um, but I agree, tax, I think the future is going to be thinking about that. One, we've been doing some work um, here at the Institute for Government just looking at a bit of international experience on this. And I think one thing that often gets missed in the sort of debate about how other countries do this is that in quite a lot of other countries it's not so much that um local areas have the ability to set tax rates and levy totally different taxes on their local area population in lots of areas um germany for example one of the big sort of bits of tax that's devolved to local areas is actually just allocating a, a fixed share of national revenues to those local areas it's not really related to the performance of their area. The benefit there is more about having a certain certainty to what future tax revenues are going to be, a certainty that their incomes are going to grow in future in line with national tax take, which local areas in the UK haven't had because a lot of their budget coming from central government grants is much more at the whim of what central government does in terms of raising or cutting local grants. So I think there's lots of issues there around um, taxes, in, including the sort of tension between uh, if local revenues are dependent on the size of your local economy and your tax base, you do then get the tension between wanting to redistribute from richer areas to poorer areas whilst maintaining those kind of incentives that Andy was talking about for local leaders to sort of be accountable for the revenue that's raised in their area and have the incentive to try and grow their local economy to generate higher tax revenues. There's a lot of issues there. Mm. Right. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks, Gemma. And, uh, any reflections, Andy? I'm, I'm going to... I'm desperately going to try and get a third question in for like a 30 second speed round because we've done everything in threes um, in this kind of session. But is there any thoughts on that before I do that, Andy? Can you hear me, Andy? Or maybe not. Sorry, Bob, was that me? Yeah, no, it's fine, Andy. I'm just going to um, let me just do this final little round of questions. I'm just, just going to fire around the panel. There was one question about what the panel's uh, view on any potential changes to levelling up uh, missions in the light of a potential change of government. And I'm just going to go around the screen um, and get that and any other final reflections in 30 seconds or less from each of us and then finish with you, Andy. Uh, so let's start on my screen. It's Anand first. Any thoughts on uh, post-election or anything else to just round up on your reflections, Anand? I mean, I'll go back to what I said before. I mean, one of the things that's increasingly sort of weighing on my mind is whether this sort of two-party adversarial fistfight politics that we have is structurally capable of doing anything that isn't short-term and highly political. Uh, so Labour will do something different because that's what you get incentives to do in our politics. But actually, I wonder whether we're just trapped in this loop of even good ideas getting unpicked because that's what our politics tells you you should be thinking about. Thank you, Anna. A real risk. Thank you. Rebecca, you're next up on my screen. I, I mean, I, I would agree with Anand. I think, I think the, who, whoever comes in and whatever form the government takes, they're going to have to deal with the same issues. Um, and the, the, it, it, it is what it is. And whatever name they put on it, um, it, it is sort of irrelevant in that sense. But 
Um, we've got to be careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, especially when it comes to the good evidence work that was done mm. um, under the 11 minute white paper. And I think um, just to pick up on the fiscal devolution question, I think um, it, it's it, what Andy said is, is correct. I think although there does need to be some disaggregation, as Gemma said, um, because actually that chunk of funding that was done based on need has gone completely out of most local authority budgets. Um, so those areas that are most in need have lost most funding. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to think very carefully about that. I mean, we're, at the moment, we're in this process of devolving risk, not powers and capacity. Mm -hmm. Great point. Thank you, Rebecca. Suzanne, you're next. Yeah, I think just to reiterate that is, you know, the big issues are going to remain regardless of who's in charge. But I think what the public will want is more meaningful ways to get involved and to set the agenda, whether that's more radical solutions like participatory budgeting, standing citizens assemblies. But those are the kind of things that they wanted. They wanted the chance to set the agenda mm. rather than just local politicians and councillors. Great. stuff. Thank you. Really important. Uh, and Gemma. On the positives, I think there is actually quite a lot of broad common agreement between the two major political parties on what the priorities here are, and there are quite a lot of commonalities between the Brown Review uh, and what the government is doing. So I think there is positive hope for continuity in this. Um, on the slightly more negative side, I think there are some signs of what others have mentioned in the sort of just changing the name or throwing things up in the air to show difference. And I think, for example, Labour have said they would ditch the missions that have been set out, um, which uh, may be not that helpful in um, sort of ensuring continuity here. Right. Thank you, Gemma. And finally, Andy, any final reflections on that question or anything else? And then we'll finish. Well, I mean, it seems likely that missions in some way, sh shape or form will uh, persist as um, Labour now uh, also seem to be um, uh, of adopting them as a way of doing uh, business, which I think is good. Um, I think when it comes to levelling up, um, because local areas are complex needs cases, it's a complex prescription. Uh, and that's where I end up having to have 12 missions because there isn't one thing that will turn the dial. It's the combination of them that gets you over the line. So that thought needs, I think, to be maintained. There absolutely is scope, and Gemma hinted at this, to up the ambition of a number of the pre-existing uh, missions. Uh, I failed in my own mission to make them as ambitious as I wished, but there you go. Um, uh, and finally, I would underpin all of this with a statute that had sharper teeth than the bill that's currently wending its way through Parliament, including having a properly statutory oversight model um, uh, body that can help governments uh, to uh, account publicly, much as the OBR does for fiscal. Thanks. Awesome. <clears throat> Very good. Yes. And that came up in some of the questions. So it's good to get to that point. Um, well, thank you. I My apologies as chair that we've run three minutes uh, over, but it was we got through a massive amount and that was uh, really excellent. So just for me to say thank you to everyone for coming and sticking with us, uh, even though we've gone slightly over. Um, thank you to the teams at UK and Changing Europe, the Policy Institute and Campaign for Social Science for putting this together and the research uh, that underpins um, some aspects of it. Thanks, of course, to brilliant panel, um, great contributions, different different perspectives, but very common themes and uh, a very helpful discussion. And finally, of course, thank you to Andy Helding. Um, thank you for your time. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed it. And the video will be up if you want to rewatch or pass it on to people. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.